We're going to praise God together. I got a few extra praise team folks up here with me today. You may or may not have noticed. Just a few. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. For oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have the great things. Will we dance in your freedom, awake and alive? Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have the great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have the great things. Will we dance in your freedom, awake and alive? Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have the great things. Hallelujah, God. Above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. Will we dance in your freedom, awake and alive? Oh, Jesus, I say, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things.
in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roll up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. And sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. resurrection life to our hearts and our homes. May renewal radiate within us and revival emanate through us. May dawn displace the darkness and spring replace the winter in our lives. May the God of hope so fill us with joy and peace this Easter that we may overflow with hope by the power of his life forever. Amen. Look at this screen. I saw Jesus crucified. I saw Jesus crucified. I spoke to him. I spoke to him as he died. As he died. I saw him in his struggle. I saw him in his struggle. I watched as he breathed his last breath. And when he stopped breathing, when he stopped breathing, I lost my breath too. I lost my breath too. The one who walked on water is no more. The one who fed 5,000 is now food for the worms. And if he has been defeated, he has been defeated. What does that mean for me? What does that mean for me? I thought that he would be the king who would rise up and rule our nation. I thought that we were the ones to bring truth and revelation. But it turns out, but it turns out, we were wrong. We were wrong. I mean, maybe we imagined this all along. As I watched his body taken down from the cross, I saw my friend was gone. My friend was gone. He was the one who found me. the one who found me. How could this be? How could this be? He must have gone before his time. Before his time. It must have been too soon. It must have been an illusion or a dream. He can't be in a tomb. I can't come to grips with the thought that the man who claimed to be I am was slain by the hands of men. And then. She burst through the door. She burst through the door. Our friend Mary, she Our said, Mary, someone, she had, said taken someone had taken the body of the Lord. So we ran to the tomb. So we ran to the tomb. Only to find an, empty, to room. Find an empty room. And the stone was rolled away. Stone was rolled away. I looked on the floor. I looked on the floor. And I saw his clothes. And I saw his clothes. And that's when I knew. And that's when I knew. 
He rose. He rose. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. He did walk on water. He did feed the 5,000. He did raise Lazarus from the dead and heal thousands. He did make the wine. He did talk to God. He did pray for those who put him on the cross and he raised back to life. Just like Lazarus, except for he would never die again. Jesus took death. Nails in his hands. Nails in his feet. A crown of thorns on his head. For you. For you. He laid his life down. He laid his life down. And he took it back again. He took it back again. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. <clears throat> Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love. Destined to die, poured out for all. Suffered as if he did All of already Every victory Is yours Just like that one more time All of already Every victory Is yours Awesome 
was willing there to give, that He from sin might set them free, and evermore with Him could live. There is a God, there is a God, He is alive, he is alive. and if we live, Jesus 
Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, there's so much more to come. If you will, have a seat. We want to go ahead and invite our children to children's worship, ages three through kindergarten. today if there's any day not today good morning amen amen my name is David Long and I'm Courtney Long and we would like to introduce to some and reintroduce to others Jesus Jesus is creator deliverer chain breaker miracle worker death destroyer friend and servant today will you say yes to him Jesus is judge He's the lawyer, he's the mediator, he's even your substitute. He's the giver of second chances, a miracle worker, a forgiver, always working and unafraid to step into your darkest moments. Today, will you choose him? He may not always fix your problems, but he does, he does know how to handle your problems. He is demanding, yet gentle. He expects a lot, yet understands stages of growth. He is not afraid to confront, challenge, and convict, yet is always driven by a deep love for you. Today, will you say yes to him? His grace can get lower than your lowest lows. Your worst moments don't push him away. If anything, they draw him closer to you. Remember, he's a miracle worker, right? He took on death. He died in our place. God raised him up from the grave, and God does the same thing for you and for me. So today, will you say yes to him? For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross, Colossians 1, 19 through 20. The work that God sent Jesus to do, he completed. The perfect work for the forgiveness of our sins has been displayed by the love of God. When Jesus died on the cross for us, that was the perfect sacrifice for our sins so that anyone who calls on him can be forgiven, including you. God didn't just promise his love, he proved his love. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. Our blessed Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything. As we worship today, we open up our hearts to receive the word in joy and understanding. May the songs we sing, the words we hear, uplift us, Lord. Inspire us to live a life that honors you. We lift you up, Father God. We lift up those that are suffering, that are whether physically, emotionally, or spiritual. Bring them comfort and healing. Lord, and use us as vessels, Father God, that we may minister them. Father God, you are good. You are more than good to us. Help us to remember the blessings that we received and not to take them for granted. May we never take for granted the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice that he made for the love of us. As we go forth from this time of prayer, may we carry your light into the world, shining it brightly for all to see. May our light reflect your love and bring others closer to you. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.
in the Gospel of John, <clears throat> Easter morning began with running. I want to welcome everybody here today. It's great to see you. I'm so grateful for all of you in person, grateful for many of you who have joined us online today. In John chapter 20, it begins with running. And here's how it goes. First two verses of John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb, so she ran. Repeat after me the word ran. She ran. And she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to him, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. Now I'm going to show you here in just a little while, throughout John 20, there's a lot of running. So some of you look at John 20 and you hear about resurrection and running and you're like, I'm on board. Because for some of you here, running is a hobby. It's fun to you. When you're bored, you're like, I'm just going to go on a run. How many of you are like that? How the, the runners, don't be ashamed. Where, you, where, where are you? And how many of you are never like that? Can I get a few of you? And maybe some of you are more like this right here. You, you may think, I don't run, so if you ever see me running, you better run too because there's something chasing me or coming after me. Or maybe for you, it's if you see me running, please kill whatever is chasing me. Or maybe some of you, it's my bo if my body is ever found dead on a jogging trail, just know I was murdered elsewhere and dumped there because <laughs> there's no way you would ever be found there. There's a lot of running in John chapter 20. Mary's going to run multiple times. I'm going to show you this here in just a moment. But if you notice in John chapter 20, verse 2, she's not running because she believes Jesus is alive. She thinks he's still dead. She just thinks his body's been stolen. So in John chapter 20, verse 1 and 2, Mary's not running from Jesus, but she also isn't running to Jesus, but she is running about Jesus. So she's not running from him. She's also not running to him. She's running about him. Now I hope that people in this space today that you will never run from Jesus. I hope you will run to Jesus. And I hope you will always run about Jesus. So for Mary, she's running about Jesus, even though there's some confusion in her life. She's not able to put all these pieces together, but she's still running about Jesus. Our mission here at Sycamore View is that we want to help people see Jesus. We want to run to Jesus. We want, want to run about Jesus. We want to help equip people to run to Jesus, to run about Jesus. The last few days, we have done just that. The last few days, right here in this worship space for 84 hours, since Wednesday night at 8 p.m., we've had an around-the-clock prayer time. Over 100 people participated in this, where every hour for the last 84 hours, people have been crying out to God for, for themselves to know God better, sitting in the presence of God, interceding on behalf of other people, 84 hours. Friday night, we came up here for a Good Friday service because for us to enjoy or participate in an Easter morning and to get everything Easter has to offer to us, we also have to take time to reflect on the death and the cross of Christ because you don't get resurrection if you, if you don't have death. Wednesday, we called the church to a day of prayer and fasting. And I really appreciate some of the messages that came in from some of you of how the day made you more aware of promptings that God was giving you or aware of God's presence. I was really touched by some of the teenagers who chose to embrace the challenge to pray and fast. And we had a seven-year-old who for 24 hours prayed and fasted. And I asked that seven-year-old if he would do me a favor and create a video talking about his fasting. So check out what Liam has to say. Hi, I'm Liam and I wanted to tell you something. So, today I was fasting and it was really hard to fast because I, it was just... So, it was just my friends would have like so much food and I didn't get to have food because I was practicing fasting and self-control. And um, I just prayed a prayer. Each time I felt like I need, I was hungry, and um, it was really good. And there's this one thing. So uh, what I learned today is that God is more important than God is more important than food. We need God more than we need food. Bye. Oh. <clears throat> we need God more than we need food. And one thing about what Liam didn't share in the video is that day they surprised them with Chick-fil-A for lunch. 
Church, I've been fasting since I was 19 years old, but if there's ever a day when I'm fasting and somebody brings me Chick-fil-A, the spiritual warfare inside of me, of, <laughs> like I'm going to have to call friends and mentors and give wisdom. Is this from God or is this Satan in Genesis 3? Like just taste and eat. Like I, I don't know, but Liam stayed strong, put that sandwich in his bag to eat it later on in the day. Over the last few days, a lot of us, we've been like running to Jesus, running about Jesus. Now, in most accounts, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, when it comes to the death of Christ, so just the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, most accounts have Jesus dying on a Friday, and all accounts have him rising on a Sunday. And in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when it comes to Saturday, the disciples give you nothing. You get what happens on Friday and on Sunday, but Saturday is like this day of confusion. It's like a day where they are suspended between light and darkness. Some of us may feel like you live in the Saturday. There's the confusion. What has happened? It's also a Sabbath day. So for all the disciples are honoring a Sabbath day, which was a day of rest and refreshment. It was also a day of trusting God, that God's going to keep the world going. And for them, it was a day, like Matthew and John, as far as we know, they're apostles of Christ. Like they were there on Saturday, yet they give us nothing about what happened that day. Like, can you think about a time in your life when a loved one has died and what the next day is like? I mean, the next day you feel numb, you space out, you may stare for a while, you know, you may have, you may have no hunger, maybe you are hungry. For them, it was a day of refreshment, a day of rest. It was also a day of the reality of their dreams have died. For them, there was a lot of brokenness that they experienced on that Saturday. Think about it, the broken dreams broken relationships, broken hope, broken foundation, broken future. Have you ever experienced any of those? Right now in your life, are you experiencing any of those? Let's talk about brokenness just for a moment. Let me share with you something. A, a part of spring that is broken is the weather in Memphis, Get right? And maybe just an annual reminder of all the seasons that we have in Memphis. There's a lot of them. They're not just four. I mean, everything from winter to hell's front porch to actual fall. And right now, we're in the season of pollening. Are some of you experiencing that right now? I mowed the other day. My mower's green. By the end, it was yellow. Uh, just for all of you first-time guests today, we are giving you free Zyrtec as you walk out today. This is, Jesus is alive. We're here. Elders are at the door today to give you a shot of Flonase or Afrin on your way out to the parking lot today. I had a 6 a.m. meeting on Thursday morning. I pull up at a convenience store at 545 to get caffeine, water, and to say hi to a friend. And there was a man who was out uh, by his car. He was fixing a flat tire. As I'm walking into the convenience store, I said, Sir, I know you're almost done with that, so congratulations, and hopefully your day can only get better from here. And he looked at me. He said, Do you know what we call this flat tire right here? And I was like, I don't know, but you're about to tell me. And he was like, We call this right here. Thank you, Memphis Potholes. That's what this is. <laughs> This right here, if you look at this image, look, uh, Fox uh, on Channel 13 had this search for and reporting potholes, in which my first response was, who of any of us have to search for potholes? You just drive on a road and you find them. I got a few other fun images on here. I mean, one guy, City of Memphis, fix our, fix our roads. Dude's like knee deep in it. Maybe the next one, potholes in most places, potholes in Memphis. And if July and August come and potholes aren't fixed, this is going to be us right here. And I'm inviting all of you to the barbecue, all right? You can, you can come and join me. Think sometimes about potholes in life. Sometimes life has these circumstances and things we don't expect, and we're riding down the road of life. And there are times where you see a pothole and you avoid it. You just move over a little bit. It didn't get you. There are times you may hit it, and it doesn't do anything. There are times you may hit it, and it may do a little bit of damage. And there are times you may hit a pothole, and it does a lot of damage. And here we are on Easter weekend, where some of you, it may be your first Easter without a loved one, or a first Easter where you have crushed dreams or promises that have been broken. And maybe this is just another Easter with reality of things that have been lost in your life or dreams that have been lost in your life. There's a story about a guy named Neil. You know, from 1854 all the way until 1929, 200,000 orphans were placed on trains up in the Northeast. And they were placed on trains and sent westbound, where along the way they would stop at towns. 
And groups of about 30 to 40 of these orphans would get out in front of these people, and they would pretty much, it was like livestock. Now, these, these were orphaned for a lot of different reasons. Some of them were orphaned because of epidemics, or maybe it was a result of the people who died during the Civil War, or alcoholism, or broken families. Around 200,000 placed on trains, 30 to 40 of them would line up like livestock, and then these people would come and would ask them questions, and would like ask them medical questions, or check their teeth, and then some would be taken into new families and homes, and the rest would be placed on a train where they would go to the next town. So Lee was his name, not Neil. His name was Lee Nailing. And Lee recounts the story. At the age of eight years old, he and his two brothers were placed on a train heading westbound. And they had been in an orphanage for two years. Their biological father found them, placed them on a train, handed them a pink envelope and said, whenever you find a home, I want you to, eat, uh, to mail me here. Lee got on the train, fell asleep at night. When he woke up, there was no pink envelope. For the rest of his life, he never reconnected with his father. They stopped a couple of times along the way, and at one place, one of his brothers was taken by a family. The other two brothers were placed back on the train. The two brothers were taken into a family. But it was out on a farm. Lee grew up in the city. He didn't know some things. So on the first day, he's there on the farm and he left the door of the chicken coop open. All the chickens got out. So that father sent him away but kept his other brother there. So within just a few days, Lee has been sent away from home, has now been separated from bro both brothers. And here he is as an eight-year-old with a broken heart. This husband and wife took him in. And that night, there was hardly any words spoken. And the next morning, Lee was determined to run away. He had been rejected many times, and now he was going to reject. So he was set the next morning, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to run away. But he woke up to the smell of biscuits and gravy. So he went to the table, and as he sat down, he reached for a biscuit. And Miss Nailing stopped him and said, not until we pray. And she began to pray. And she began her prayer with our father and in that moment Lee opened his eyes because in the orphanage he had experienced a lot of guest preachers and traveling preachers who had come in and the, many of them led them through the, the Lord's Prayer our father who art in heaven but as he opened his eyes he could see Miss Nailing who for her there was this smile on her face and she prayed to God as a father as if God was right there in the room and he had never heard someone pray like this and in that prayer, she prayed this. She said, God, thank you for the privilege of raising a son. And he said for the first time in his life, he felt like a privilege. No one had ever said anything to him like this before. And in that prayer, she prayed, God, give us the wisdom to raise him and help him to be wise, to make good decisions as well. And as I said, amen, Mr. Nailing said, dig in, son, and eat. After breakfast, they were taking him down to, get a, to the barber shop to get a haircut. They stopped at all six neighbors along the way to introduce the neighbors to their new son. And he would go on to say, that day I learned that I have two fathers and a mother. I have an earthly father and a heavenly father, and I can talk to both of them and his life was changed forever. In the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, you have been brought into a family, given a place at the table, where God knows your name, where God made a choice in choosing to come here for you, to die for you, to give you a space at the table of God, to bring you into God's family, a place where you have privilege and worth an identity. This is what God has done for you. I want to invite Truett and Noah and Scout, if you'll come and join me on the stage just for a moment. And church, I want to ask all of you to uh, open up to, in your Bibles to John chapter 20. And instead of just reading it, I, I want you to, to see and experience it this morning. So for those of you who may not know, Truett and Noah are my two kids, they're my two boys. Scout is not my daughter kind of like my daughter or friend. You're my favorite lane. You're tied, tied for my favorite lane. All right. And for those of you watching on, it may look like these two boys are taller than me. They're not, all right? It's just the way the, the cameras 
shoot the stage. Right. Yes, my boys are taller, but they've also both know that at any time we try to wrestle, Dad, Dad still got them. All right. I need 10 minutes to stretch before we do. I still got them. All right, Drew and Noah, you're going to play the part of Peter and John. I want you to scoot, just to scoot back just a little bit because we're going to start with Mary Magdalene. Can y'all say hi to Mary over here? And Mary, here's what happens. Uh, do, do you like waking up early? Are you an early bird? Not really. All right. Do you like to run? You don't like to run. Okay, that's all right. Mary Magdalene, she woke up early. If you were there that morning, you probably w would have woken up early too. Uh, can you give me kind of a running motion here? All right. All right, we're going to go over to the empty tomb. You ready? Or the, the tomb. You ready? All right, all right. And I want you to pretend like this right here is the tomb. So early in the morning, she comes and she looks in. Just kind of glance in. Glance in. You see anything? Nothing's there. So now you run. You don't have to really run, but kind of give me a run in motion. Run, run. And you run. We don't know how long she runs, but she's probably out of breath at this point. Act like you're out of breath just a little bit. All right. <laughs> Sweaty, out of breath. I'm with you. I'm with you. And then you tell them, look, he's not in there. He's not in there. So now Peter and John start to stretch. All right. Got to stretch because now they're about to run. Give me y'all's running motion, boys. Y'all ready? That's it. That's it. Who's faster between the two of you? Me. You think so? All right. I mean, neither of you are faster than me, but that's all right, all right? Now, <clears throat> Peter and John start running to the tomb. So we got John, or you're Peter, Peter. John, all right? You know, they start running, they're running. And then John ends up being a lot faster than Peter. John was a wide receiver. Peter was the offensive lineman, all right? John was Crystal Lane, Todd Lane. All right, this is how we go. All right? He gets all the way to the tomb, and he stops. But John doesn't go in the tomb. Peter, who's trailing behind, he runs all the way into the tomb. Look, stop, stop. All right, there, there you go. Don't want you to run up right off the stage. And he looks in. And because and, maybe, maybe Peter was like the risk taker. Like maybe John's playing it careful. Peter goes right in to see. And as he does, it says John glances in. And if you notice, glance, glance, glance inside the tomb. <laughs> and while he's looking in, look in verse 8. When he looks in, there's nothing there, but it says John saw and believed. Now, John uses the word belief a lot. And I don't know if this, in this moment if it's John who sees and believes that Jesus rose from the dead. The very next verse tells you there's still some confusion for them of what this scripture, how scripture talks about resurrection, what it means, a little confusion. But I do want you to know this. There can be confidence in your curiosity. Then when you're not sure exactly how faith is evolving in your life, there can be confidence in the curiosity. There can be confidence in the confusion. Because Mary, who wasn't really sure what was happening, was still choosing to believe in Jesus. She's still calling him her Lord. For John, he looks in, and maybe in this moment he doesn't believe in resurrection. He doesn't really get it, but he's still clinging to Jesus. And then what it tells you is, in verse 10, it just says, John and Peter went home. Like, maybe they're like, uh, nothing's here. They go home. Go home. No, not really go home, uh, but just go back over there just for a moment. And then, look, it doesn't tell you Mary ran but the very next verse, in verse 11, says Mary's there. She's just left standing. And it says she looks in again. Second time she's looked inside the tomb. And this time she's weeping. <laughs> Great. Good job, Scott. Good job. She begins to weep. All right, the three of you, y'all can go down. Can we put our hands together? Thank them for coming on up. Thank you. It says Mary begins to cry. I want you to think about this. Two times on that Sunday morning, Mary's alone at the tomb. In verse 2, she's alone at the tomb. She goes to get Peter and John. They come, they look, nothing's there. They go back home. Again, she's alone at the tomb. Two different times she's alone at the tomb. Two different times she takes off running to give them a message. But the second time when she looks in, she sees two angels. Now, I don't know if the angels were there when Peter and John looked in because they don't say anything about an angel. Maybe they didn't see him. Maybe they appeared when Mary looks in. But this time she looks in and they have a little conversation. In verse 13, what it tells you is this. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? And supposing him to be the gardener. And I want you to circle that word in your Bible. 
there in John 20, verse 15, the gardener. Because this is always, I'm like, what? Like, did Jesus rise from the dead looking like Larry the Cable Guy or something? Like, what is it that she thinks he looks like? just thought that maybe the gardener is the, the only one who would be around. But I think this is language that John wants you to know that Jesus is doing a new genesis, new creation. That just as God gardened a garden in Genesis 1 and 2, Jesus has come to create everything new now. She thinks he's a gardener. So she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbi, which means teacher. It wasn't the first word Jesus spoke to her that made her know it was Jesus, and it wasn't the conversation. It's when he, it's when he said her name. When Jesus said her name, it's like her eyes were open, ears were open. She knew exactly who it was. Like God knows your name. God doesn't call you, hey, bro, or hey, sis, or hey, dude, or hey, person. Like, God knows your name. Seven billion people walk in the face of the planet. God knows all of their names. The billions of people who've lived before us, God knows their names. So I want you to see what happens in John chapter 2, because in one moment, Mary goes and she glances in, and she sees nothing is there, and she goes to tell the apostles that nothing's in there. Jesus' body isn't there. And then by verse 18, she's going back to them because now she has experienced and encountered Jesus. So now she goes back to say, I've encountered him, and he knows my name. Like he spoke my name. And there's something about Mary in John 20, verse 2, where she looks in and doesn't see what's happening, isn't really sure what has happened to his body or how all this is playing out in her life or in the world, yet she's still choosing to believe in Jesus, and she goes to talk about Jesus. And by verse 18, she knows that Jesus is alive. She has encountered him, but she doesn't just sit on the truth or reality of it. She goes to let other people know he's alive. And some of you woke up on Easter morning and you're kind of in that John 20 verse 2 space where maybe you believe something is happening, something has happened, but you're still trying to process faith and you're still trying to think through a few things in your life, but you're here today and you're choosing to believe something about Jesus anyway. And sometimes these can be the best evangelists in the world. It is people who are a little bit confused and trying to process faith, trying to work out some things, but they are choosing to believe in Jesus they're still choosing to cling anyway. And maybe you're at the point this morning where like, man, you're John 20 verse 18. It is like, I have encountered Christ. Like I have seen him, I have experienced him. And now like you are not asked by God to sit on that truth. You were called by God to go and run, tell somebody, talk about Jesus, talk to Jesus, talk for Jesus to other people. And maybe you're somewhere suspended in that space. But hopefully today at some point you can say, I've encountered Christ and he knows my name. And have you ever been at a point in your life where you've forgotten that God knows your name? Maybe you've forgotten your identity or your worth or your purpose. Barbara and Regina were sisters. They lived in 1755. They were the age of 11 and nine when they were kidnapped. Barbara and Regina lived on a farm in Pennsylvania their mother and brother had gone to run an errand one day. They're, they were there with their dad and another brother when two Indians broke into their house. Now, most of the natives in that area were really friendly and kind, and, but these two men were not. So the dad stood in between the two men and his two daughters and was offering these men money and tobacco and food. Like, what, what do you want? And then the father told the two girls to go fetch water down by the brook just to get them out of that space. And when the two girls got to the brook, they heard gunshots and they turned around to see fire. And then they were taken captive. Well, for days and weeks, they traveled with these other kids who had been taken captive. And at night, they would lay down next to each other and they would sing a song that their mother had taught them to sing. Alone, but not alone am I. And the last line of that song was that I am with him and he with me. Lonely, therefore, I will never be. 
And there was something about that song as they laid there at night that gave them the faith to believe that one day they will be set free. A few weeks later, the girls were separated. And Barbara ended up in this one village and camp where they were not allowed to speak their native language. I mean, they were fully immersed in the culture of that place. I mean, from what they wore to the moccasins to jobs they were taught to do. And she was there for three years when Barbara one day escaped. And she ran through the woods for 11 days and then ended up at Fort Pitt where they were able to reconnect Barbara to her mother and brother. Six years went by and Barbara at this point was married and had a family when she received word that 200 kids have been delivered from this one place and they were at Fort Carlisle. So Barbara and her mother went to Fort Carlisle as fast, as quickly as possible. And when they get there, got there, they saw that this line of 200 people, they saw the state of mind that they were in, like they had been either deprogrammed or programmed that they didn't know their name. They didn't know where they were from. It's been like a decade. So they go down a line of all of these people who had been delivered and they're speaking the name Regina and no one is responding. They're looking for Regina, but they can't find her. So they turn around to leave. And that's when the colonel came over and said, is there, can you think of a birthmark? Was she wearing any kind of jewelry? And there was no birthmark, no jewelry. And as they were about to leave, the colonel said, what about a song? Do you, do you have a song? So Barbara and her mother began walking back down the line and they just began softly singing that song. Lonely, alone yet not alone am I. I am with him and he is with me. Alone therefore I will never be. And they began to hear a woman cry. And Regina began singing the song with them. And there was something about the song that awakened in her a memory of her name and her identity and her worth. Like, I don't know if there's ever been a point in your life that you've forgotten your name. Maybe not, but I bet there's been a point in some of your lives when we have forgotten our identity, our worth, our purpose. And today is a day where we sing the name of God, but it's also a day when heaven sings your name. When heaven is singing, to us, to invite us into deeper places, and for some of you that maybe you have been astray or far from God, it's the day where the song of heaven is inviting you back into his family to awaken something in you of faith and substance of death, burial, and resurrection to remind you of your name and your purpose and your identity and your worth. And maybe you're thinking today, of crying out. There are probably some of you in this room that you have a discipline to pray every day. And maybe some of you haven't prayed in weeks, months, or years. Yet when we call out to God, I believe God answers. Like when we call out to God, when we speak God, I believe God answers. And, and God will never do what we do to people sometimes of, well, I hear you calling me, but I don't have this number saved in my phone. What is your name? Heaven has no voice messaging system. Heaven doesn't have an auto voice system. When we cry out to God, God answers. But I think the question for us today isn't do you believe that if you cry out to God that God answers, but if or when God calls your name, will you answer? And I'm not talking about when you die, God calling your name. I'm talking about today, heaven speaking your name, will you answer? Because I want to encourage you to be like Mary, who either moment In John chapter 20, when she's not really sure what's going on, but is still claiming Jesus as the Lord of her life, or confident in what is going on, claiming Jesus as the Lord of your life, will you move to Jesus? Run, walk, fall, reach, go for him. And when you're too weak to go for him, know that he's coming for you. Speak in your name. I want to ask Tommy Collier and Tolly, they'll be in the front and the back. Casey and Shelly are going to be on the sides to receive you. I want you all to go ahead and go to your place today. And if you're in need of the prayers of anyone, like the leaders in this church or 
Like maybe you just need a reminder today about your name or your identity in Jesus or your worth or your purpose. We're surrounding this room with leaders and prayer warriors who are here for you to pray with you or to speak words of God's promises over you. If there's someone in this space who has never surrendered their life to Jesus or have been baptized into Christ, is it something you would consider? Here in two weeks on April 14th, we're going to have a baptism Sunday. We do these sometimes, and we'll baptize people anywhere. We have a high view of baptism in this church, but for some people, they need to circle a date on a calendar, and they need to work to the date. So this Wednesday night, we have a baptism class at 630. If it's something you are interested in, or you want to be equipped to talk to someone else about what it means to surrender a life to Jesus, this could be for you. And here in just a moment, some of you are guests in this room, and you are invited to come to the space at the table where we take the bread and the cup every Sunday. And we have six tables around this room with the bread and the cup, and we move to a table. Now, I also know there are people in this church who, like, you preload, you get the bread and the cup before you sit down. And just be aware that there may be people sitting in the middle of these aisles today who didn't get the bread and the cup. So it may be a moment of climbing over each other to go get the table. And if so, give each other high fives, fist bumps, remind people they belong in the family of God. Remind people that God knows their name. Jesus died and Jesus rose from the dead and he knows your name and through his death and his resurrection, he has provided a space for you at the table. You are welcome in this place. Will you bow your heads, close your eyes? And God, today, whether it is with a whisper or a shout or a nudge, God, will you just speak people's names over them, that you know them, died for them, rose for the dead for them. You're pursuing them right now. And as you call out to us, God, help us to answer you. Uh, Jesus, for everything you have done to make all that we do today worthwhile and worth it, we thank you. For the cross, the empty tomb, for your presence with us today. So God, we do not take this bread or this cup in vain. May today be a day of new beginning for some of us, of commitment and recommitment for us. That, God, we have a story to tell. So through through the courage that is in us, through the presence of Christ and the Holy Spirit, may we leave this place today. May we leave this place eager to talk about Jesus and for Jesus and about uh, two other people about Jesus. And Jesus, this is all for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said. Amen.
I invite everybody just to stand where you are. Um, we're going to close with a hymn of heaven and a chorus of There's a Stirring. As we just celebrate what Jesus has done for us and the hope we have for a future with the Lord. There's prayer going on around the room. We want to honor that. So we're not going to jump ahead, but uh, will you, just a moment, you may uh, have someone in your heart right now, but you may just kind of glance across the room and you see somebody and you just feel a, a need to pray for them. So just right where you are, just offer a prayer for someone else around you. Hymn of Heaven has become a, a favorite song. And uh, I pray that it's something that can wash over us today as we uh, think about everything that's happened today. Josh, thank you for your message. Uh, thank you for the hope that you uh, shared and pointed us to. Uh, so, church, let's sing. How I long. The songs of pain we sang through doubt and fear. In the end, we'll see that it was worth it when He returns to wipe away our tears. There will be a day when all will bow before Him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with He who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. On that day we join the resurrection. And stand beside the heroes of the faith With one voice, a thousand generations Sing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain Forever He shall reign So let it be today we shout the hymn of heaven with angels and the saints we raise a mighty roar glory to our God who gave his life beyond the grave holy holy is the Lord so Today we shout the hymn of heaven 
with angels and the saints, we raise the mighty roar, glory to our God, who gave us life beyond the grave, holy, holy is, holy is the Lord of glory, holy, holy Thank you for participating, you for participating with, us with us on this Easter morning. This Easter morning. The mission at the Sycamore the Church, the Church is to help people, is to see, help Jesus. people see Jesus. And for many people, many people Easter, Easter is a launching point to do just that. Here are a few next steps we'd like to invite you to consider. You can scan this QR code to sign up to make any of these steps. We have a Baptism Sunday coming up on Sunday, April 14th. For some of us, when it comes to big decisions in our lives, it's helpful to circle a date on a calendar, commit to it, and then work toward that date. If you need a couple weeks to prepare to join Jesus in the waters of baptism, join us this Wednesday night at 6.30. Josh and I are hosting a baptism class for anyone interested in baptism or for those who are eager to be more equipped to talk with others about it. Our mission is helping people see Jesus. And if you want to discover more about how we're trying to do that as a church, please consider joining us for a view into Sycamore View at 9 a.m. next Sunday, April 7. We believe that the resurrection of Jesus inspires us to spread life throughout the city God has called us to serve. On Sunday, April 21st, we will engage in a Restore Day. You're invited to join others in this church by committing to a designated service project where you will serve alongside of others for the sake of the city. And April is our 901 Offering Month. For our Sycamore View family, please prayerfully consider how you will give to our 901 Offering as we partner with nonprofits and ministries to spread the love of God throughout the Mid-South. So scan this QR code and decide which steps you're wanting to take today. 
the tomb is empty, Jesus is alive. Let's go live out this good news. couple of announcements so uh, Phil uh, first of all um, we need to remember that the guest luncheon is next week so if you have a opportunity to be a part of that then we'd be thankful for to have you join us uh, also if you uh, would like to give we do have boxes in the back for, for giving or you can use one of the, the electronic uh, methods that are available uh, texting and that sort so would you uh, pray with me as we depart uh, just go ahead and stand Father, we are so thankful for this past week and the opportunities we've had to both worship you and to draw closer to you through our prayers, through focused prayer time and the efforts of this church to, to try to engage in that. Thank you so much for giving us that opportunity. Father, thank you for the pictures of Jesus that are in the Bible. Thank you for the way that you have revealed him to us, the stories and the the the. the photography that, that that comes to our mind when we think of the scenes that he endured. Father, we're thankful for the the babe in the manger and we're thankful for the master teacher and healer and mentor and friend. Sometimes when we look at the cross, it's a little hard. It's dark and dreary and, and painful. There's agony. And then we think, it's my sins that put him there. But today we've been talking about something much more exhilarating. The tomb is empty. Death is not victorious, and he has promised that death will not be victorious, but that we too will, will have an opportunity to de defeat death. And Father, we know of the picture of the returning Christ, the one who's coming back to claim his own, and Father, we look forward to that day when faith is no more because it has become sight, when hope has been fulfilled, and when love will reign eternally. And Father, we look forward to that. But Father, I pray that in this coming week that you will bring to our minds that your spirit will embed within us just those pictures, just those stories that will help us to draw closer to you through Jesus Christ. Thank you for all that you've done for us and for calling us to be as your children. Bless us this week in Jesus' name. Amen.